And welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rayo2, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, uh, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, to learn more about the Second Realm Parallel Network built upon a f- foundation of truth, peace, and voluntarism, just visit Pasnia, P A Z N I A dot com, uh, or consider joining our Pasnia Committee of Correspondence uh, on Telegram, that's t.me forward slash Pasnia chat. Uh, also, make sure to check out our full schedule of events here in the physical Second Realm, uh, including our flagship event, uh, Vanufest. Uh, the link to all of those is pasnia.com forward slash Vanufest. Anyway, today I, re- I reconvene with SW from Samurai Wallet. I uh, wish it were under better circumstances, but as I've come to find out, uh, if you have solutions, the problems to be solved never seem to slow down. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I came across the case of uh, Roman Sterlingoff, an early Bitcoin adopter and uh, user of the custodial mixer uh, Bitcoin Frog. Uh, Notice I said user, whereas in this case, uh, it seems the state, along with the closed source help of chain analysis, uh, is accusing him of being a creator, founder, uh, and along the same lines, uh, money laundering. Uh, It's the same story over and over again. Uh, Even for just general interest and awareness, uh, this case is worth covering here. Uh, But upon further examination, uh, Roman's situation highlights the dangers of chain analysis and uh, the need for open source chain analysis, uh, like that done over at uh, OXT.me, where you can actually take a look at... uh, at uh, you know, take a look at uh, you know the track of the coins and all, and all that. But uh, anyway, along with us, W, I'm also pleased to welcome Roman's lawyers, uh, Mike Hassard and Tor Eklund. Uh, we'll start with their backgrounds, uh, get a rundown on Roman's case. Uh, we'll talk about the need for uh, you know the open this open source chain analysis, uh, because just as with Vanu, to avoid and remain invisible to the coercers, you have to first learn their tactics and, and learn what they're doing. And uh, that is that is uh, the help the uh, folks at uh, Samurai provide uh, with their tool OX, OXT.me, along with the uh, wallet of the Free Republic, featuring the most advanced set of, B- of Bitcoin privacy tools uh, in the mobile wallet space at present. Uh, so if you're new, please do make sure to check out our first couple com- uh, first couple discussions uh, with SW. Um, but yeah, anyway, enough of that. Uh, SW, I'll start with you, man. Uh, welcome back to the uh, Vani podcast. Uh, how are we doing today? We're doing great. Thanks for having me back, Shane. Uh, I know I was just here recently, but it's always it's always good to be back. Yeah, um, yeah you, you mentioned uh, OXT, and I think it's a, important to kind of focus on that um, in today's discussion, because it's the exact reason why this case is the exact reason why we acquired OXT. Uh, one, to take it out of the hands of chain analysis, and two, to provide counter analysis to what chain analysis provides and do it in a way that's open source and that's reproducible and verifiable. So we're hoping to help as, as best as we can using that platform for um, Roman's defense. Uh, we're looking at all of the public information that has been put out there um, by both the state and by Roman's team. Uh, and, you know, without even going into <laughs> all of the stuff that I'm sure Tor and Mike are going to go into mm-hmm. just based on the, the public um, statement of facts that the government has put out there. It is so sloppy and so shoddy. And it, you know, it looks like this guy is just getting absolutely railroaded. Um, so if my work and my software and, and our code can be used to help clear a guy's name, uh, I can't think of something better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally agreed, man. Totally, totally agreed. Um, and uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, you know, Tor and Mike. Uh, yeah, Tor and Mike are here. Uh, so Tor, Mike, thanks so much for uh, taking some time to come on the Vani podcast. Uh, if I recall from from thank Twitter, you for having us. Um, yeah, you guys are, are traveling around right now. You're busy, so I guess tell tell us a bit about uh, you know what what you're doing at Current in Europe, and uh, yeah, I guess uh, yeah, again, welcome. Thanks for having us, Shane. Uh, Tor and I are currently at the Bitcoin in Landel conference at the Hotel Princess in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, we uh, did a couple of podcasts, and uh, a guy by the name of Lucas Betchart from the Swiss Bitcoin Association heard about Roman's case, and he set us up with the Bitcoin meetups in the German-speaking world to spread the word about Roman's case. We've uh, recently been on this trip. We started in Zurich, went to Munich, then we went to Berlin, now we're in Stuttgart. And coming up in the next couple of weeks, we have Mexico City from Monerotopia with the Privacy Crowd, followed by a podcast with Peter McCormick on what Bitcoin did and Bitcoin 2023 in Miami. Uh, my name is Mike, and I've been working with uh, Tarkin Law for between two and three years now. I'm an associate lawyer, and we focus mainly on computer law. We do a lot of represent hackers, uh, crypto enthusiasts, and other uh 
computer and cypherpunks to get caught up in the U.S. administration of justice or injustice, as we like to say. You know, take it from here, Tor. Yeah, hi. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep. Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Uh, great. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Tor Eklund. I am a U.S. based lawyer out of Brooklyn uh, who works with Mike. I have been representing people accused of computer crimes in federal court in the United States, uh, across the United States for the last decade. And um, this case is one of the wilder cases and more important cases we ever had because there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that uh, Roman is absolutely innocent and he's been spending the last two and a half years in a jail outside of Virginia awaiting trial. And um, the response from the community just on this, you know, short trip has been amazing and very, very helpful um, because as we talk about this case, you know, it becomes clear to us um, what we need to be clear on, uh, aspects of Roman's story, but also what's been really helpful is you know you can get into the rabbit hole with these kinds of cases sometimes and you just miss some of the obvious things and as we've been going along people in the community have been pointing out a lot of stuff that like is totally obvious in a certain sense <laughs> but you miss because um you're so far down in the rabbit hole um and so we're just really grateful to the community for their collections and and their support um yeah that's that's, that's mm -hmm. it for the moment yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, thanks for those uh, introductions, guys. And uh, um, yeah, I guess uh, I yeah, I, it's, it's interesting you've been doing that. You said you've been doing this for a decade and this was uh, this is one of the more wild cases. So I guess it does, you know, ten, 10 years is a long time. And I'm sure um, there's been yeah, I'm sure you covered a lot of cases uh, over the years. But um, I guess let's, let's focus on uh, on Romans here. Um, I'll, I'll turn either one of you can, can take it from here. But, um, you know, tell us a bit about, uh, you know, Romans case and, and how this all transpired and, and where we're at. Well, Roman Sterling off. Um, moves to Sweden with his mother from Russia when he's 14. He moves to Gothenburg, Sweden. And Mike, what year is that? That's like 2000. I want to say like 2003. Yeah, 14 years old. And um, he never actually goes back to Russia. But one of the fixations that the United States government has had in this case is that, oh, he's a Russian, he's a Russian. Oh, He's a Russian. And um, around 2009, 2010, he's, he's still living in Sweden. He becomes an early adopter of Bitcoin. And just like these Bitcoin meetups we've been going to ourselves and learning a lot about, and that's been helpful to learn about the culture, as he starts going to Bitcoin meetups and he starts, uh, you know, people ask him to set up wallets because everyone's excited about Bitcoin. And so he sets up wallets for people. He charges a small commission and he accumulates uh, a lot of Bitcoin, you know, because when he starts in January uh, 1st, 2011, you can buy one Bitcoin for 30 cents. And so he's taking his paycheck. He works for a Swedish marketing company that does digital and, you know, uh, what would you call it? Brick and mortar advertising as well. And he takes his paycheck from his day job and he invests, invests it in Bitcoin. And he starts going to all sorts of Bitcoin meetups. And like I say, he accumulates all this Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin skyrockets, he becomes a millionaire overnight. Not like huge millionaire. I think the best we can figure is like somewhere around 2 million US dollars, right? And early on at one of these meetups, somebody tells him that he should be using a mixer to mix his Bitcoin to protect his privacy and security. So he starts using a mixer called Bitcoin Fog, but he's never ever run but not a single piece of evidence in the record that he ever did. Um, what the government's main piece of evidence in this case is uh, in 2011, and this is where sort of the black box, black box tracing issue comes in with the uh, chain analysis is they claim that he registered the domain name 
www.bitcoinfog.com, you know, for the, you know, the ClearNet website, the kind of website you can go on, use any kind of browser, Microsoft Explorer, whatever, Chrome, or whatever your kids are using these days. And, and just, you know, you can go to that site. There's no allegation he actually designed the website, ran the website. There's no, not a single piece of code or any kind of communications showing that he did. They've got this multi-layered transaction that they claim um, starts with him. But when you look at the criminal complaint, they give you a wallet address that we can't trace. We think there may be a typo in it or, or whatever. We just can't find this transaction. And there's a big question mark um, in the um, criminal bank. Uh, yeah, with a piggy bank, uh, uh, like on the first link of this multi-layer transaction that they say ultimately goes through a Liberty Reserve, goes through a couple Mt. Gox accounts, goes through a Liberty Reserve account, and then pays for the DNS registration for BitcoinFog.com. The first thing to notice about that is that it's completely legal to register a domain name. Uh, the second thing to realize about that uh, is that it's in 2011 and the statute of limitations, which is you know, a time limitation on how far back you can uh, charge somebody with the crime is five years. So it's about uh, six years outside the statute of limitations for the charged crimes, assuming that this even was a crime, uh, which it wasn't. And then that's pretty much the crux of their case. They also say that through really what we consider to be questionable tracing that he did some uh, test transactions in 2011 by sending some Bitcoin to Bitcoin Fog. Uh, we think the tracing is really, really flawed on that. Um, and the other thing to note about that is there's not a single piece. And this is something somebody pointed out, uh, mentioned this and asked us about at one of the meetups is there's not a single piece of code anywhere um, that he's written. And they, when they arrested him, they seized him. They seized him with three laptops, like four Raspberry Pis, three terabytes of hard drives, his handwritten diaries, uh, handwritten backup, uh, handwritten notes with all his backup codes, um, and not a single piece of evidence in there that he operated Bitcoin fog. There's not a single piece of evidence in everything that we have seen that shows him operating Bitcoin fog. This case turns entirely on uh, tracing. Uh, really speculative tracing using chain analysis reactor and a couple other uh, black box surveillance um, forensic platforms uh, from people sitting at desk 6,000 miles away in Sweden. There's not a single eyewitness in the case. And, and Mike, I'll let you fill in the gaps there of what I, what I missed in this sprawling, convoluted Kafka-esque narrative. Well, one of those frustrating things with defending a case like this is that we're not getting any of the input data or software code or source code. It's uh, accusations that Roman is the operator of Bitcoin Fog. You know, we've asked them to provide this to us, and they've they've sandbagged us at every request. We've also asked to put uh, Jonathan Levin and Michael Groniger on the stand, and they're lawyers have come back to us like what could be more important than an individual's life and liberty you're going to take that away and you're not going to uh explain your work or show your work you're acting like the wizard behind the curtain with your black and, box forensics and jonathan levin and, and michael garniger for those of you who don't know are the co-founders of chain analysis and basically run the show there and they're the ones who've made uh, a ton of money from their contracts with the United States Department of Justice and the UK's Serious Crime Office. And this case is one of their first cases that they ever work on with the Department of Justice because it starts, uh, Chain Houses starts in what? Either they start in October 2014, 2015. And this case starts at the Russia desk of the United States Department of Justice in Philadelphia, of all places. And um, well, it goes from there. The beginning of chain analysis is uh, pretty interesting because while it's not registered as a company in New York, at least in, in Delaware, until 2015, the roots of it date back to Michael Groniger's visit to Japan in 2014, 
where he meets with Mark Karpilas, the CEO of Mt. Gox at the time, mm. and Michael Groniger, who had been working and collaborating with, uh, I think it was the CEO of Kraken. He believes that you know he's going to try to trace the Mt. Gox hack to figure out where the Mt. Gox Bitcoins go. And he goes to Japan, and he's working with the, the lawyers who are acting as trustees for the Mt. Gox uh, bankruptcy in Japan. And he speaks. And for those of you don't don't Mike, why don't you explain what my Mount Gox is in case we got people who don't <laughs> listen who don't so know what Mount Gox folks, is. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. So Mount Gox is one of the first major Bitcoin exchanges that people were able to buy and sell cryptocurrency on, and it evolved out of uh, a Magic the Gathering online exchange, hence the name Mount Gox. Uh, it started as a, a card trading website, and as the card enthusiasts became to became more enthusiastic about crypto, uh, the people who are running Mt. Gox realized that, you know, maybe we could turn this into a crypto trading platform, and they did, and they were successful for a, a, a significant period of time. But in 2014, they suffered a major hack where they lost about 850,000, I think it was, Bitcoin, and they were shut down and the subject of uh, criminal uh, cases in the United States and Canada. In fact, the, the civil suit, uh, to get back whatever could be recovered is still ongoing. So all the people who had their Bitcoin stored in Mt. Gox when it was hacked have, have, have since lost out and have not been reimbursed as of yet. In fact, and Roman was one, Roman's one yeah. of those people for a payout. Because Roman, as an early Bitcoin adopter, uh, uses Mt. Gox. Because Mt. One of the issues that we have, again, like with all these like shoddy speculative forensics in this case, is their um, their claims that Roman paid for the DNS registration, BitcoinFlog.com, is dependent on the Mt. Gox data. Now, the problem with the Mt. Gox data from that and uh, Japan to try to find this money is uh, there's a book that came out recently by Andy Greenberg. He's a wired reporter and it's called Tracers in the Dark. And it recounts the story of Michael Groninger getting the Mount Gox data on a thumb drive from Mark Capellas. And uh, Capellas or Capellas, I'm not quite sure yet how to pronounce his name. But so Groninger looks at the data as deleted and that basically the integrity of the data has been compromised. And he mentions, he says to Marco Pellas, he's like, you know, this data is missing files. It's, been, you know, files are deleted. Uh, the integrity is, you know, in question here. Do you have a backup of the data? And Marco Pellas says, no. And he says, you know, what? Not only when, not only did we get like digitally hacked, our servers were physically accessed. So, so we hadn't read that story yet when we first got the Mount Gox data. When we're looking at the Mount Gox data, which we get in the spreadsheets. It's missing transaction hashes. It's got wrong dates. There's just transactions, you know, we can't trace. It's a mess. And once I, we read that, we we're like, oh, okay, this this makes a lot of sense. And what they used the Mount Gox data for basically was to to claim that Roman used the same IP address as uh, this email address, shortmint at hotmail.com. That's associated with the DNS registration and also with the um, – uh, pseudonym of the person who went on Bitcoin Talk, which is a, uh, a, a chat forum, talk forum about Bitcoin started by Satoshi. Um, and this person who uses the moniker, what is it, Amadeto? I'm a, I, I can assure you, Amadeto. Thank you, which means Happy New Year's in Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, they, they say, based on the Mt. Gox data, these IP addresses, uh, they say that that person was Roman. But the, again, the problem they have here, they've seized all of Roman's computers and everything, and there's nothing on them that corroborates that claim. Um, it's just kind of a wild, wild guess. But so it gets even better with Karpilas because Mark Karpilas is prosecuted in Japan and found guilty and sentenced to four years in jail for, wait for it, for falsifying Mt. Gox data. Oh, yeah. But he doesn't do jail time in Japan. Yeah, it's wild, right? Like the the, the integrity of the whole foundation of their um, investigation. Well, he, he never served just, any time. 
because he went to go work for the United States government. And he is a, uh, as far as we can tell, an employee is sort of a United States Department of Justice. And, you know, DOJ is fine with working with criminals. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, there's a lot of evidence. Mark Apelis ran Bitcoin fog. Uh, then uh, there isn't any that Roman did. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess something that comes to mind for me in, in the realm of Vanu, the, uh, the, I guess the, the founder of the Freedom Strategy, talked about public and private coercion. So public coercion being the state and private coercion being private individuals that would violate a person and property. Um, and this is a, a great example, you know, a more you know, common vernacular for this is fascism. But this is definitely a combination of like public and private coercion where, um, you know, obviously the... Um, you know, like they're the, the people in the state, you know, the, you know, the state agents aren't stupid, right? Like they, they understand how shoddy a lot of these cases are, but they go forward with them anyway, because what's, I, I guess my, my perception is, you know, it's all about, you know, all about winning your cases, regardless of what, what's, uh, you know, what, whatever, you know, whatever else or over, over anything else. Um, so yeah, obviously the state's happy with, uh, you know, basically, um, it gives them pretty much an easy way to go after anybody digitally. Right. Um, and that's kind of what it, kind of what, it, what it looks like. So there's, there's some really far reaching yeah, ramifications. Yeah. And there's no accountability for them, right? Like, and, and generally what happens in America um, uh, in, in federal criminal cases, 90% of them uh, plea out. In other words, the defendant just pleads guilty because uh, whether they're innocent or not, because of the massive costs involved in a federal criminal trial, like you usually need about two or $3 million um, to, to really do one right when you come down with the experts and all, you, you know, it's all the costs involved. Uh, and then the other 8%, so 90% take a plea. The other 8% are dismissed on user on a motion to dismiss because they're crap. Of the 2% that actually go to trial, less than 1% uh, result in an acquittal. And to me, I just look at that and I say, well, that system's completely rigged. There's no way, right, that the, you know, the government's like basically batting a 1,000. Um, and so those are, those are the odds that we're up against. But one of the things, when I look at this evidence and the forensics and everything's so sloppy and you see, you know, people making money. One of the investigators, this guy named Aaron Bice for the IRS, he's working, he's supposed to be working for the United States public, right? On the taxpayer dime. He starts a private company during the pendency of this investigation that he then uses on this investigation. And when they finally decide to arrest Roman in 2021, after this long, you know, meandering, what is it like seven year, multi-million dollar investigation that really turns up uh, nothing. His company is featured prominently in the Department of Justice press release, which is a big deal if you're, you're trying to market your private company. And uh, about five months later, Chainalysis buys it for what we think is a few million dollars. They won't tell us. And, Probably more than that. Uh, Yosis goes and hires... Yeah, probably more than that. Now it's got like a revenue stream of like $10 million from the United States government. Uh, chain analysis's revenue stream goes from basically like zero to roughly $330 million. Um, there's a lot of people cashing out on this case and making money, and uh, none of those people are Roman. They're all either with the United States government or they're in the private sector marketing their black box surveillance software. Um, you know, And I think for me, fundamentally, it, there's this big conflict here between the profit motive and justice. And I don't think, although I'm, you know, I'm a capitalist in some sense, but I don't think the profit motive has any place, any place in our justice system because it distorts justice and you get what happens mm -hmm. here. People who engage in this sort of like confirmation bias are really sloppy. Their eyes are more on, you know, the money that they're going to make and the status that they're going to get because these people are all status obsessed because another subplot in this whole convoluted story is that they've all been talking to the press and Andy Greenberg for his book for a couple of years before the arrest and here how the book been auctioned for uh, Hollywood documentary by Alex Gibney an Oscar winning documentary filmmaker and people are in magazines and they're doing conferences and you know, they're it, it's, it's obscene. Yeah. Right. It's obscene. I, I consider this this prosecution a vanity prosecution and I consider it an obscenity. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so SW. I think, I think it's worth. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think it's worth that. also mentioning. I think it's worth also mentioning that, <clears throat> at least from what I've seen in the in the notes of this case, they don't have any other evidence other than this this black box chain analysis reporting, um, which yeah, is already which is already sloppy, which is already filled with mistakes that we've found. Um, so, you know, in, in all the other cases that I've been aware of where chain, uh, chain analysis was involved, th their reporting was supplemental to actual evidence. Um, yep. Here and, there's none. And here, as far as I can see, there is none. Uh, so the, the, the analysis that has been provided um, is the only thing being provided. And no one's... No one's explaining. I, 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 I think you know Tor and, and Mike have or tried to the to the court, uh, but th these analysis that chain analysis creates are probabilistic. Uh, they, they you know they are not deterministic. There's degrees of probability, and the degree of probability is far too low to be considered you know primary evidence in a case as far as I'm concerned. I agree with that. I think it's total junk science and. Um... You know, again, it's they just got the dollar signs in their eyes rather than, um, you know, doing honest work and really being concerned whether or not they had the right person. You know, they were busy thinking about their next press release or their next fundraising round because after Roman gets arrested in uh, 2021, April of 2021, uh, Kinosis does a fundraising round, right? And they raise $150 million. They use the uh, press releases um, around the arrests, you know, where their chain analysis reactor was used to fundraise. And this is a common phenomena in criminal law where a new, there's newly emergent uh, type of forensics um, and there's no standards like there are here. There's no peer review like there, there, there isn't here. There's no standards, no peer review. And people come in and they start to profiteer and a, a lot of innocent people get thrown in jail. Yeah. Uh, according to the Innocence Project in the United States, 51% of wrongful convictions in the United States are from junk science based on newly emergent forensics. And, and that's what's going on here. And to go back to this point, now there's no collaboration at all. There are no eyewitnesses in this case. There is nobody who said, oh, I overheard Roman talking about running the mixer or I saw him driving a Lamborghini because he didn't have a damn Lamborghini, right? They're, they're, they didn't know. Oh, we put him on the stand at a pretrial hearing. Everyone told us we were crazy. We said, no, we're not crazy. He's innocent. Go ahead. Ask him any damn question you want. <laughs> and the, the government could, didn't have any, couldn't ask any good questions. And at one point we had made the point that they don't know anything about Roman. They don't know who his family or his friends are or anything. They didn't know what his job was. They didn't know how he made his money. And at one point, oh, okay. were, 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 <laughs> hey, go ahead, Tori. Go for it, Mike. Go for it. Yeah, yeah no. I love this part. <laughs> at one point in the hearing, uh, one of the prosecutors is standing in front of Roman while he's in the witness box. And he's interrogating Roman clearly because he hadn't uh, uh, completed the investigation uh, properly. Tell us who your friends are. Tell us who your family is. Tell us how much you were making. And we put the kibosh on that. But it, it just shows that the government did not conduct uh, an open investigation in this case to try to figure out who actually ran Bitcoin Fog. They approached this case with a large uh, confirmation bias and that stemmed from the IP address match that gets this primacy in this case uh, that it doesn't deserve. And, and, and to go again to the, the point that the SW is making about the lack of corroborating evidence, they, Roman goes to the United States with his girlfriend to my, I think it's like Miami in 2017. The United States government puts him under physical surveillance, very expensive. They uh, put him under a wiretap and they put him under what's called a pen trap, which traps your signal traffic. Basically, they're monitoring all his internet traffic. Mm. Not a single piece of evidence that he's operating Bitcoin Fox. Right. Like Nothing. like you think they would stop there, but you just, you know, uh, like they're just like caught up in, 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 in I just it's it's really fucked up, man. That like, you know, nine years in when Mike's telling that story about this cross examine nine years in, they don't know who his family or friends are. They don't know yeah. how he really made his money. They don't know what his job is. And they didn't bother to like search his apartment in Sweden. 
right? They're just like convinced and you can see them. You know, I think what they did is they're like, oh shit, you know, we spent millions of dollars on this investigation. It's been going on forever. Let's roll the dice and arrest the guy and we'll find evidence when we arrest him. Okay, great. Well, they arrest him with all his computer, cell phone, laptops, handwritten notes, hard drives, you know, the works, and they don't find anything on that. So it's like a big wah, 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 wah moment. Then they're convinced, you know, Roman, you know, after he, he quits his, Roman quits his job in 2014 and decides to move off the appreciation of his Bitcoin. But then realizes, oh, this is going to run out. He's, um, Bitcoin's volatile, right? He's like, I better start a business and, you know, learn some skills. He starts a VPN business and that VPN business doesn't work out. Eventually it goes under. But to do that, he gets a couple servers in Romania. And you can see this moment of excitement with the government when they're going out to seize these servers in Romania as if they were the Bitcoin fog servers. And you guessed it, the government seizes them and there's no evidence on them of Roman running Bitcoin fog, right? It's another one of those wah, 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 wah moments, but they, they, they still, they still won't talk. They still won't stop. It's like, it's reached the, these heights of irrationality where in the superseding indictment, which is the, the last charging document, right? They've got what's called this asset forfeiture um, allegations. And they list this wallet address that they say has, oh, that Rome, they say Roman controls. He had, he doesn't, he doesn't know anything about the damn wallet address. And they say it's got like 1100 plus Bitcoins in it, right? Okay, well, you can look that up on the fucking public blockchain. We look it up. There's no Bitcoins in it and it hasn't transacted since 2012. But then they say, oh, we've got this secret sauce. We've got this chain analysis reactor and it secretly traces it back to this cluster, right? And what are you supposed to say to that? Like they just make shit up, right? Like their answer to everything is that, oh my God, he's a super villain and he was able to hide everything. But that's consistent, like for everybody in the world being guilty, right? Everybody in the world is guilty under that viewpoint. You're a murderer. We just don't have any evidence, but you were so good, you you could hide it. And this, and I'm gonna shut up. But I want to say one more thing about this. In my ten years as a computer lawyer doing federal criminal defense of people accused of computer crimes, I have never ever had a client where there wasn't a single trace of evidence of what they were accused for on their, you know, except the instant ones, you know, on, on their laptop. Nobody is that fucking good. No. But they're in this like fantasy world and they're buying into all that bullshit and superstition because at the end of the day, they don't understand it. They don't know what they're talking about, right? And the way that they hide it is they just, you know, oh, everything's fucking through this. It's fucking yes. maddening. Absolutely. Absolutely right. They've, they've built their own entire industry. Chainalysis has. They've built their own entire industry on this junk science. And they've sold this junk science to not only the state, but to the uh, exchanges and to the uh, yeah, you know, services. And that governments all over the world. Governments all over the world are using uh, Chainalysis. Yes, yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, they've, they've custom built this industry. They, they, they make up analysis all the time to, um, you know, increase the perceived need for their software uh they they encourage over compliance um you know and there, there's too much interest by them by the companies and by the state to keep the show going uh and yep. and, and that's why I, you know i'm so happy uh that roman decided to fight this because it needs to be fought in court um and i you know if the constitution is to be respected if the if the rules that we've all been you know taught to expect to be true in a court um are uh, you know are to be true this evidence can't be can't be seen there's no way that this can this evidence can be shown to prove anything beyond a shadow of a doubt because there's so much doubt in the evidence you know if yeah. the probability you know the evidence uh, the analysis from Chainalysis really heavily relies on the um, common input owner heuristic, uh, which is essentially that all of the inputs are owned by a common person, one person of a transaction. And this this heuristic, while it might be true sometimes, is so unreliable to be used uh, because it's not always true. 
It just isn't. Uh, and especially if you're connected to the Mt. Gox cluster. Because the and it's certainly not it's certainly not true beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a standard well, exactly. that the government needs to prove uh, uh, defendant guilty. Yeah, well, exactly, and and you know, uh, if you know, if indeed, like the, uh, I know that you know, uh, trials and courts don't don't operate as they do on, on TV, right? So the the state won't at you know midway through the trial or towards the end of the trial have this surprise. Uh, out of nowhere evidence that they introduced, right? Or I guess that's unlikely, right? It's highly uh, unlikely. They it's can't highly unlikely. Say, yeah. You yeah, know, so yeah. we know what we know, you know, what what everyone knows. That's happened pre-trial, discovery, all that stuff. Uh, so I can't see how he loses this other than a really biased jury. And it's, yeah, I think it's important you know, to point out, I think it's important to point out that heuristic is the Greek word for guessing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, like they, they really favorite. are. They, 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 they my... choose this word that means guessing. It's not a science. It's a guess. It sounds better. Yeah, and I, I'm not trying to be arrogant by by saying that. I'm I'm just trying, you know, to look at it and to, and to to even consider that this type of evidence is being accepted mm. by itself to me is crazy. But okay, the judge allowed it because maybe the jury will decide. Let, let the jury decide. Yeah, it, and you know, I think one of the more dangerous things that I, I'm concerned about. I, I, first, of all, I agree with everything you're saying. Like, I I, mean, I I think it's insane. And 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 everyone who's coming on this case, we've said to them. Uh, we said, listen, you know, if you see anything that makes you think that Roman is guilty, let us know. Everybody just says what SW says. He gets pissed off and starts working on the case harder because of, because of the, you know, injustice of it. But, like, the thing that concerns me most, really, uh, you know, along with the tactical step, is the psychology. And uh, what's happening here is most people don't understand this stuff. And they don't want to look stupid. So what they do is, is they just like nod their heads up knowingly at the government, but the government doesn't understand this stuff, right? And everyone has this like insecurity about looking stupid and being the person who doesn't really understand that. And then there's this fear, oh, because I don't understand this stuff, um, I might accidentally be letting go somebody who's like a criminal mastermind. But they just ignore the fact that there's, no fucking corroborating evidence for any of the government's claim. And even chain analysis says with our method, we need some kind of outside empirical, uh, you know, confirmation. And they, and they don't have that here. And I can see them sweating. And when it comes to hiding stuff, it's not Roman who's hiding stuff. It's chain analysis and the government. Chain analysis, we subpoenaed their source code. They're refusing to give it to us. We're missing a lot of the input data. A lot of the stuff we have is just fucking Excel spreadsheets, right? It's like an amateur shit show. But, you know, the scary thing is they might fucking get away with it. They, they don't what even else? give the full Bitcoin address. Yeah, they no. don't even give the full Bitcoin. Oh, my God. No. Yeah. Oh, God. Hit that. Yeah. SW. We're, we're missing a lot of wallet addresses in this discovery. <laughs> it makes it almost it makes it difficult to conduct our own investigation into the government's investigation. And I think that one of the things that this highlights is the, the revolving door between the government and these private contractors, yeah. like analysis. It's what happens disgusting. is people will start working with the government. And then after a couple of years of government service, they'll go on to a seven figure job at a government contractor and they have all their connections in the government. So the government contractor then uses these people's connections to then secure further contracts with the agency. Uh, we've seen this happen repeatedly in this case. There was a prosecutor who was working on this case, Yuli Lee. She's now the senior legal uh, director with K Analysis. Uh, you see this going on with uh, the invest the actual or the people who arrested Roman. You have Matthew Price and uh, Tigran Gamba Ryan. They're both uh, they are both the arresting officers at LAX. Now they're working for Binance. And you just see this over and over. Aaron and over. Bice starts a Aaron, company Aaron and Bice sells it for millions Jim. of dollars. Yeah. You know, they're, they're like, buying yeah. influence with the federal government, and it doesn't look straight to me whatsoever. And it looks, it's totally corrupt, you know. But like in that soft banality of evil way, because I, yeah. I, I think they honestly don't realize it. Like they've, they're so they, they just have so bought in to their psychology that they're like the good guys they don't realize that they're fucking acting like a criminal gang and they're you know they're 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 worse i think than the people that they think that they're taking down and and one of the things i can't stand 
about these types of people over at DOJ. And I don't want to totally trash DOJ because there's good people over there, but th there's like this haughty morality that they've got that's holier than thou. And when we um, went to one of the first meetings with the government and we were like, this is, you know, this is bullshit, man. This is total bullshit. They, the, one of the prosecutors turns to us, goes to me, right? Because we're not, we're like, we're not taking a fucking plea. We're going to trial, man. This is bullshit. You got the wrong guy. Your work is shit. And goes to me, I'm really disappointed in you, Tor. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm <laughs> that was hilarious. In me. That I'm was like, what are you, my books. dad? Like, but that's <laughs> the problem. Is that's their psychology in their head because so many lawyers take deals. And when you cut deals, and that's your business model because you're too much of a pussy to go to trial, right? You're dependent on the prosecutor, right, to get that good deal. So you're constantly throwing your client under the bus. But the problem is here, Roman can't take a deal because he'd have to lie. He doesn't know anybody. He doesn't know anything about this. He doesn't even have the fucking coding skills to write the sophisticated software you need to, to run a custodial mixer like Bitcoin Fog, right? But like, and, and so that moment to me just keeps on jumping out. Like, you're not my dad, man. This is an adversarial proceeding. And you know what? We're going to trial. And, and you know, like, don't like, I'm really disappointed in you. Okay. What are you going to do? Give me detention? I'm going to have to stay after school. All right, it's like the stay fucking. After court, DOJ, court. You gotta stay after court. You stay after court. Just you have to stay after court. DOJ is just high school with guns, if you ask me. <laughs> That's probably a pretty apt description. Now, what, what, wow. One of the interesting threads in this case is the story of the lead prosecutor, Catherine Pelker. Oh God, yeah. So Catherine Alden Pelker, uh, in 2014, she's working at the the Russia desk uh, for the FBI in Philadelphia. And she sends out this uh, memo on the FBI intranet, their internal internet communication base, database, uh, targeting Bitcoin fog for uh, laundering drug money from Agora Marketplace and Silk Road. And that case, this case follows her throughout her career. When, when we, we ask, why is this case in D.C., we take a look at uh, Ms. Pelker's history, and it becomes clear that it came to D.C. through her. You know, after she's working at the FBI, she, she goes to law school at Georgetown and the case transfers to Washington, D.C. Then she gets a job at DOJ as a prosecutor. And this case lands after she graduates from Georgetown Law and becomes a lawyer. Yeah. So the case has been following her. And this case is her baby. And uh, as the FBI investigator who initiated the investigation into Bitcoin fog, she's a material fact witness to this case. And under the Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, defendant, criminal defendants in federal criminal cases have a right to cross-examine and, and put on the stand uh, their accusers. It's a confrontation clause. And we went to court and we told her, like, look, like you're the FBI agent who started this case. You're a material fact witness. We want to put you on the stand. She stood there, looked us both in the eyes and said, no, I'm not. Because she can't, under the <laughs> rules in the United States, be a prosecutor. You cannot represent a party in a case that you're a material fact witness in. That is one of the first things you learn in legal ethics class, right? It's like a really serious ethical violation. And the fact that they were so casual about that, that they that DOJ allowed the FBI you know, investigative agent who I cross examine in every fucking case I've ever had, right? That they allowed her to be uh, the prosecutor on this case shows you not only how sloppy they are, but how ethically lax they are. It you also know? shows how they didn't expect this to go to trial. They expected yeah, they this to plea out like all their other prosecutions. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, I mean, that's appalling to me, right? What they did here. And, and, you know, because it's like a vanity, what they're doing is they put an innocent man in jail for their fucking vanity project and for their bank accounts. And chain analysis is, is just greed, 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 greed with no care for justice. And they claim to be on the side of law enforcement, but they're not enforcing the law. They're enforcing the profit motive, you know? And, and then that's they, why we, we've, people, named, we, yeah. we've named our series of talks here at the Bitcoin meetups across Europe, Profits Over Justice, the disturbing prosecution of Roman Sterling out. Everybody involved in this case on the government side has been putting their own careers and their own financial interests over justice. Mm -hmm. 
Certainly, certainly. So I guess what what comes to mind for me is, you know, like the, um, you know, you know, just, uh, you know, a hopeful, hopeful perspective on it is that, um, you know, the clown world is becoming more apparent. Unfortunately, like if we could just replace details and we could be talking about pretty much any big institution um, in the U.S. Um, or maybe even worldwide, too, whether it's medicine or food or, or, or whatever. Um, so I think that's good that like it's like it's, it's getting so ridiculous um, in pretty much all these areas. And this one, this one, too, it's it's, it's definitely one of the most absurd um, that I've ever I've ever come across. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, I guess that, that's, that might be a, a, a good perspective on it. Maybe, you know, maybe, uh, um, yeah, maybe, maybe it's a, yeah, it's, it's a good time. It's good. He's challenging it and hopefully, hopefully a good outcome. Now, one of the, uh, main pieces of evidence that we discussed earlier is this IP address match. Now it's been determined over and over again that matching an IP address is not, the, is not personally identifiable information. You know, somebody could be over at your home using your Wi-Fi. Somebody could be spoofing your IP address. You could be connecting the same VPN of the IP address with somebody. Sorry, we have an You'd be using a proxy here. server. Like, You'd be you using know, a proxy like, server. It, it, it doesn't deserve the primacy that it's getting in this case. And I think that it's interesting that it's the government's strongest point. really shows that they don't have anything on him other than that. They need it to tie him to Bitcoin Fog, and, and then their math just doesn't add up. So then they go to Chainalysis, and Chainalysis is using their, their new clustering methodologies, which are based on heuristics or guesses, to try to support this, this, uh, this position that they have. And it just I, it's going to fall on their face. I call the cluster analysis the cluster fuck because I think it's just <laughs> like such bullshit. You can go across <laughs> different um, – you know, if you go across different tra tracing platforms, you'll see that – different platforms give different attributions to clusters. Like one will say, oh, this is whatever Silk Road. The other one will say, oh, it's Coinbase, right? Or they'll miss it completely. And this goes back to what SW was saying is that this is, it's not, the software is not deterministic. Nope. It's, it's probabilistic. And, uh, it, and, it is, and the probabilities. Sorry. No, I was going to say one of the, Things that the government has done is they've reached out to their contractors. So one of their contractors is a man by the name of George Kapos, and he's a student or a PhD student in England, and he's a student of greatest minds in blockchain forensics. And she kind of came up with this clustering methodology a couple of years ago, and you know it looks like Chainalysis reached out to George Kapos to write a paper and then gave him all the information related to Roman's investigation, which is subject to a protective order, by the way. And which they uh, haven't so, given to us. Which they haven't the given way. to us. I am not aware of what they did. Yeah. And they do a, a study on it, and they draft a white paper, and we checked out the white paper. And the conclusion is that, you know, this methodology that was used to uh, accuse Roman Sterling of is subject to a significant amount of false positives. Yeah. And that, you know, it shouldn't be relied upon to prove guilt. Yeah. And they even presented this uh, at a presentation in Boston at the Usenix Security Symposium in August of 2022. And, you know, Sarah Mikulzon, she doesn't want anything to do with chain analysis, from what I can tell. You know, she, she doesn't like what they're doing with her research and her, and her, uh, her studies. She thinks that, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, but, uh, you know, she hasn't been cooperating or working with chain analysis herself. And I think that's telling. She got offered a lot of money to work for them, and she turned it down to her credit because I think she realizes that she's created a monster and that she's really, um, really done a disservice to the community. And if I was her, I would be really concerned about the fact that her work and her close association with chain analysis is uh, resulting in innocent people sitting in jail cells right now. You know, it's like, you know, a lot of these academics and a lot of these Wall Street people, they've got this like rosy, oh, you, you know, this stuff works great. And they don't have much real world experience and they don't understand how fucked up things can get in the uh, real world. And here, you know, the real world is really fucked up because people are busy making money. People are all excited about the book coming out. People are all excited about being in Wired magazine. And, you know, those are all things that I like, but I am not putting fucking people in jail because of my greed. You know, I'm not putting people in jail because of my need for status in the community or my career or whatever. 
And that, again, I, I, I just infuriates me about this case, you know, among other things. And then they, of course, they seized all his money, you know, when they arrested him. So he can't, you know, we're around running around all these Bitcoin meetups holding out the fucking tin cup, you know, because <laughs> like they, they've got they a forty two billion dollar budget. Yeah. And we're borrowing money, right? Like, and thank God, you and know. Ken like, is an $8.6 billion company with about $536 million in total funding from private equity firms. Yeah, and they just had a convention in New York, like a conference in New York that the tickets were $600 a pop for. You know, and then Andy Greenberg's up there who wrote the book on all these guys. He's up there with Tigrad Gambaran, the arresting agent. And they're all like on stage, you know. I'm a little kind of pissed at Andy. Andy, if you're listening, you know. Um, because I've known Andy now for about a decade, you know, uh, you know what's going on there. I know you got a family you got to pay for, but you should be thinking seriously about, you know, what you've done with that book because Roman's in it, and he never bothered to check with any of Roman's defense lawyers. You know, he only found out at like uh, about uh, four days before he had to have the final edits in on the book that we were on the case. And I asked him, I said, Andy, how do you fucking you know that any of this shit works? I got silence, right? <laughs> I know for a fact that none of the people he talked to from the book can cite a single peer reviewed paper or any kind of scientific verification about these methodologies, right? Because, you know, it's just really fucked up, you know? But unfortunately, it's a very common thing that happens to criminal defendants outside the blockchain context because the psychology is the same. When there's this newly emergent forensic science, all these people rush in to make money. There's no standards and innocent people get thrown in jail because of, you know, what they call the CSI effect in the United States, which CSI is this television show that's like about a crime lab that's always like solving crimes Enhanced. with like, yeah. I used to love that show. Yeah, I know. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I love so, that show too. So it's more, bullshit it. though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there's a lot of money at stake here. You know, Blackstone, Dragonair, Funders Club, Bank Mel Bank uh, of New York Mellon, and Emergence Capital have all participated in Chainalysis' uh, uh, private equity funding. They even got GIC, the Singapore so Sovereign Wealth Fund. And, you know, they stand to lose a lot of money if Roman is found innocent, when Roman is found innocent. So, so uh, Tor, what is the... Um... The strategy then does it is it like undermine the analysis because that's really the only the primary evidence they have so undermine the the analysis on in front of the jury or is it you know undermine the you know the facts surrounding the you know the case in terms of the unusual um you know appointments or um profiteering or 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 both we're gonna first of all we're gonna tell the truth and we're to tell the true, honest story about who Roman Sterlingoff is, how he made his money in Sweden as an early adopter of Bitcoin, how he took money from his paycheck and bought Bitcoin, and how he, you know, it appreciated. He became a millionaire overnight, and how you, you know, he tries to start these businesses because he's worried. Like he did not. For another thing, crazy thing about this case, he just doesn't have the kind of money he should have if he was running Bitcoin Fog for ten years. Right. He should have tens of millions of dollars. And that's nowhere, nowhere around. And the government's always like, oh, you must have a top secret, you know, wallet somewhere, you know, in Le Lex Luthor's, you know, office or whatever. But um, in, in fact, in fact, uh, in one of the government's uh, key pieces of evidence that they've turned over to us, Roman's Kraken accounts uh, that he put the money into after go it went through Bitcoin fog when he was using it as a user. It clearly shows the story that corroborates Roman's explanation for what he was doing with his money. You know, the Kraken account show when he creates them, there's a lot of deposits. It's kind of like small deposit testing and there are a bunch of larger deposits and he builds up the amount that's in the Kraken accounts. And then you see him withdrawing from the accounts over time, using them. There's not a lot of, of, of uh, deposits into the account at all. And then you see him, once his funds start to go down a little bit and Bitcoin starts to go down a little bit, he starts trading it, trying to get it back up. And, you know, he's not that sophisticated and his trading doesn't work. It's not making him money. And then when it gets to a certain point, that's when he realizes, you know, oh, I need to get a real job. He tries setting up a music center in Gothenburg, Sweden. He tries becoming a motivational speaker. He has YouTube videos out there. Then he, uh, you know, he realizes that maybe he should become a pilot, and that's why he flew to Los Angeles. So when we're telling the story of, 
the money and it, it just doesn't add up to the government story and everything we've seen it, just totally corroborates Roman's explanation it, for how he wound up in this place. And then as somebody else pointed out to us, this is a great thing, you know, talking to people about these cases. Okay. If you're a criminal mastermind who's, you know, created this, you know, super evil genius custodial mixer called Bitcoin fog, and you're cashing out your royalty payments from it, would you put it in a KYC account like Kraken under your own name and have provided your own photo ID for it? No. Right. Like anybody. Yeah. Or, got or I guess, kind of sorry, sorry, to, sorry to jump in, but like you you mentioned earlier on about yeah, carrying, carrying all of your digital devices on you, like, in, like all, like your personal diary and all yeah. of that, that's terrible operational security. Um, so yeah, so yeah, it's, he's, it's, he's not a, like a criminal mastermind just off, you know, a couple of those things. He's just a guy trying to, you know, make money and, you know, be private, like not really a big deal. There's, there's, there's no evidence that he could even code this because he couldn't. Right. But like in their world, they don't know anything about that and they don't understand it. And, and like, they're, again, they got dollar signs and fame in their eyes and nothing and hitting, more. Uh, hitting on the hardware that they they nabbed them with at the airport. You know, it, it shows that they don't understand what it is because they misidentify its purpose. You know, he had a, a device that was able to give him really good Internet so that he could FaceTime his mom in Sweden and watch Russian TV. The cell phone. It was like a custom cell phone he made. Yeah. yeah, he had a couple of Raspberry Pis. And, and you know, you can see in the discovery, the government getting very concerned with these Raspberry Pis. Like, they must be, you know, only a criminal, cyber criminal would have Raspberry Pis. The whole, the whole situation is ridiculous. And it scares me that these are the people in the world that are responsible for, uh, for pursuing these kind of crimes. These are the they primary... They don't know anything, and these are the <laughs> primary prosecutors of you know of Bitcoin and blockchain crimes at the United States Department of Justice, and they don't know shit about the culture. They don't know anything. Like you know, I know like dozens of people like who are computer nerds who carry their computers around. Right? I must have like I don't know a half dozen laptops and like you know various devices on me at all times. But to them. That's exotic, right? Yeah, and and true. and it's one of the the uh, like frustrating things about this case is that there's this sort of like provincialism running through it, like because they've never experienced it or it's exotic to them because they go to the whatever their dull suburban life or whatever the fuck they're doing with their life, it must be criminal, right? And and one thing I think that's really telling of that is one of the reasons that Rome is sitting in jail right now is the government said to the court. He's got four passports and they're fake. Okay. First of all, they're not fake. They're four passports because, you know, he's a dual Swedish Russian citizen and you need a passport to travel inside of Russia and one for traveling outside of Russia. And Sweden routinely issues, you know, uh, two passports to its citizens in case, you know, you want to travel to Jordan, Israel, and you don't want to have, you know, the Israel stamp in your passport when you're going to Jordan and vice versa, right? But there's another thing about it that that four passport thing that i think shows you their their lack of due diligence on this case you can easily confirm whether or not a passport is fake by simply asking the issuing government hey did you actually issue this passport they didn't do that and they made material representations to the the court that they were false right these passports were were were, were, were fake when they weren't and you know uh, despite this we still couldn't you know, get him out of jail because of like all the fear and all the superstition. But uh, to me, that's emblematic of, 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 of the quality of their investigation and how they've approached this whole thing. They just don't bother to check. They don't want to know. There's even like communications in the discovery where like one of the agents is like uh, ignoring, he comes across evidence that it's completely somebody else. Right. And you see, see the person say, uh, this is a guy who sold his company, by the way, to, to, to chain houses. He's like, oh, man, I don't even want to think about that. I, I can't think, you know, we could be completely wrong here. I don't want to think about it. You just see him just turn away from it, right? There's like 40 or 50 page reports naming other people like that Shorman uh, at Hotmail.com email address that they're using to say that Roman registered the DNS. It's an it's email address that's associated with the DNS registration. Well, okay, great. They subpoena Microsoft and it comes back being owned by somebody named Andrew White, who's a person who lives in San Francisco, who deals in crypto, right? And you just see them ignore it, right? It's like, like it's just, it's out of context. It's, it's, a, conf it's a confirmation bias that they approach their entire investigation with, you know? 
the entire seven year multi million dollar investigation of taxpayer dollars that they that they spend on us, it was used and targeted. The whole investigation was how do we prove that Roman is the operator of Bitcoin fog? The investigation was not who is the operator of Bitcoin fog. Not they, they yeah. went wrong yeah. right off the bat, you know. It's terrible. Yeah, they started with the conclusion and then went out to try and put <laughs> the conclusion. They didn't. And everybody's they, they, been rewarded for their shoddy work. Yeah, everyone's making money. And there's even if we win, they're not going to really face it. You know, chain analysis, we're going to see the crap out of it, right? But, um, you know, the DOJ prosecutors enjoy immunity, right? They, they don't, there's no accountability at all. And they're the ones, they want to say that Roman broke the rules and he should go to jail for breaking the rules, but they're just breaking the rules left and right. You know, a fucking prosecutor on the case is a material fact witness. And, and that, you know, in any other case, that would be a huge thing, but there's so much fucked up shit in this case that that's just like one of the ancillary side stories. Oh, maybe we should talk about the, you know, the, the IRS criminal investigator who starts a private company and sells it for a million dollars to the lead private forensic investigator on this case. Oh, go, let's maybe, talk maybe about we talk about how the press releases from DOJ and all the arrests line up with Kane Allison's private equity funding rounds. Yeah, you know, it's just like, you know, it's like pigs at the trough. Right. And then they but they what they like to do is run around with this holier than now attitude like they're doing God's work when they're really just, you know, they've made a Faustian bargain. I'm yeah. in Germany, so I'm throwing fast in. No, all yeah, all, all very well said. Yeah, all very very well said. So so SW, um, you mentioned at the beginning about how you guys, uh, you know, you you uh, bought S O X T dot me for these purposes. Um, would you provide a, a little bit of overview on on the platform and a little bit about uh, um, how uh, you guys are helping uh, uh, in Roman's case? Yeah, sure. So um, <clears throat> O X T was developed by a, a sole developer, uh, Laurent MT, who's a Bitcoin privacy researcher, uh, mathematician and an analyst. And he created really an, an incredible um, visualization tool and um, clustering tool, really, an, an analysis platform in OXT. Um, the chain analysis tried to buy it. They approached him and said, look, we're going to we would like to pay you a lot of money and acquire this. And he said, absolutely not. Um, there's no way that I would let this tool get into the hands of Chainalysis. A um, few months later, he's at risk of shutting down. He can't afford to keep the servers running. That's where we uh, step in. We talk to him and say, look, what we want to do is make sure this can keep running, not change it in any way, make sure that it can be made freely available to anyone at any time, um, but should, you know, be used cautiously, not in, and if you look at the terms of service of OXT, it says very explicitly that this data is not to be used um, in criminal proceedings as evidence against someone, you know, uh, it, it, it must be taken with a grain of salt in the sense that all analysis, uh, as I said earlier, is probabilistic and it cannot by itself be used as evidence, uh, especially uh, in a trial for someone that determines someone's life, uh, whether they spend life in, in prison or not. Uh, so the goal of OXT, though, is to provide a counter analysis to what chain analysis uh, produces uh, and do so in a way that can be reproduced by anyone with a Bitcoin node and the Bitcoin um, or, or access to a Bitcoin block explorer uh, and, and really perform what we like to call self-defensive analysis. Um, see what chain analysis has determined in this case and say, well, let us check their work, even though we, they're not going to publish their code, even though they're not going to publish their how they got to their results. We're going to work backward and we're going to figure out what they did and how they did it. And we're going to determine whether they did it right or not. And we're going to find different interpretations of this. And I think that in the context of this case, if we can produce four, five, six different interpretations of each one of these events that they're relying so heavily on, it, can, it shows that this is not um, beyond a reasonable doubt. There is a lot of doubt here. There's five different versions of events that, that have plausibly could have been the case uh, using the same probabilistic um, uh, measures. So, you know, we hope that we can help, uh, you know, this, the, the case as best as we the, can. Uh, 
Yeah. Very good. Very good, SW. Very good. And I was uh, just pulling up on um, on screen for uh, the video viewers at Odyssey and uh, on uh, YouTube uh, if they want to. I was giving a little sample of uh, OXT.me. Um, I've gone on there a few times myself and or a number of times myself. And, um, you know, to, to look at my own to, to try to learn these, uh, you know, the, the you know, these heuristics and, and kind of, uh, you know, um, how you're doing good and how you're doing bad. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's definitely a. Yeah. Yeah. We use it. I mean, you know ourselves internally when we're developing new privacy tools we want to wait to audit the tools that we create and audit the transactions that our tools create and say this is where they're weak this is where uh we can improve um you know one of the finer achievements of our software career was when our software we uh, our feature called stowaway um sorry i think we lost them uh <laughs> our feature our feature called stowaway um fooled oxt right and the the idea of stowaway is that it it, it fools the common in input owner heuristic which is at the the core of this you know the evidence in this case yeah right so it takes um looks like a very simple transaction where you have multiple inputs on one side and one output uh, or two outputs on the other side it looks like a transaction where you could apply that heuristic and say that's one person that owns you know those couple inputs but really it could be you and me <laughs> working together collaborating on a transaction and the outputs are both you and me uh, so it defies that heuristic breaks that heuristic um I think being able to explain this and, and hopefully Tor will be able to undermine the analysis that chain analysis is providing uh, and introduce different versions of events. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, I've actually, I've got it up now. I, I forgot to log in before. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I've got it up now and uh, people can kind of see it's, it's a really neat visualization um, and it gives you a really, really good idea of, of what's happening on the blockchain. So, um, yeah, I'd certainly recommend people go check it out. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, I, I, again, I appreciate you guys, uh, picking that up, um, and having the foresight for this, cause this was not something that was on my radar, but, um, apparently it was on, uh, apparently, yeah, obviously it was on your guys's. So, um, that's fantastic. And maybe they, maybe they, uh, it, it has been about an hour and I think I told them about an hour for the interview. So, um, uh, maybe they, uh, maybe they had to, um, maybe they ran out of time or something. Um, we'll give them another, another couple minutes, but, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, this this has been uh, this has been fantastic. Um, you know, as as good as it yeah, could be it for, for the uh, you know for the subject it. matter. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we we you know we want the best things for for Rome. What we don't want to see is someone innocent be put behind bars, right? Um, and and I think from what I've seen, Roman is innocent. Uh, you know, of these charges, or at least the evidence that they've produced is not convincing at all. Um, and shouldn't be up to the standard of evidence uh, and hopefully you know doing our open source uh, research we'll be able to send our our findings to tor um and if it can be even a little bit useful then that's we'll chalk that up as a win and um you know yeah yeah, definitely, definitely. So I guess just to, for for the, for the listeners here, I mean, just uh, um, in terms of coercion, like uh, uh, we've talked about, you know, we've had SW on a number of times, talked about, uh, you know, Samurai Wallet and various privacy tools in all sorts of areas, um, digital privacy and security culture, and uh, it's not something to uh, like to to ignore or look over. Um, it's definitely worthwhile to to do as much as you possibly can, and and this is another one of those cases um, where, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, um, even if you do as much as you can, even if you're completely innocent, uh, um, things can still happen. So just, uh, um, you know, yeah, you got to be aware of the, of the, of be, be aware of, uh, you know, our, our adversaries. So, um, SW, anything else, anything else before I let you go, anything else, uh, anything new, uh, with Samurai coming out or any, any, uh, recent updates that, that uh, you, you, you want to mention? Uh, gosh, I think, uh, it hasn't been that long. No, I mean, we, we, it hasn't been that long. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we keep toiling away working away um one of our primary goals for uh this year is um decentralizing the coordinator we've been working on that for some some time uh and we're getting pretty close now so you know that's a that's a, a big project and a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes mm -hmm. you know so 
may it may seem like oh we, we haven't had an update in a while well <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot of uh, groundwork being laid in the background but i assure you we are we are busy at work oh you, you guys have always demonstrated proof of work so that's yeah the you, your building's <laughs> got to happen so um yeah no yeah. no definitely no definitely no no concern there and i guess the last thing i'll mention is uh um that uh i do appreciate like uh i'd, I'd heard i'd heard tor and, and mike on podcast before um, but like, I, I certainly appreciate, um, that kind of hard nosed lawyer attitude, um, at least by tour and, and Mike's oh, got yeah. it too. Um, like that's exactly the type of yeah. attitude that's needed. If, 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 if this is going to be one, it's, it's gotta be that kind of like no bullshit, like, you know, fuck yep. off kind of attitude, um, and not put up so, with anything. So, absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. That's, you know, I, I first became aware of tour like 10 years ago. Oh, um, really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, on his first case. He was he was defending um, uh, who was a buddy of mine at the time, uh, Weave Andrew Weave um, Andrew Orenheimer, who went by the name of Weave. He was a hacker, and um, that sounds familiar. Yeah, well, he got he figured out the flaw in AT and T's um, iPhone database that if you provided a phone number, I believe this is what it was. If you provided a phone number to the public, you know, endpoint on their database it would spit out all contact details, you know, without yeah, any authentication. Okay, yeah, I, I remember this. Guy, right. Yeah. So he wrote a program that would just input a bunch of phone numbers and, and record what the database put out, um, which, and then the government came after him hard, you know, like super hard. Um, and uh, Tor was the one that defended him. And I remember being like, this guy, you know, one, he has balls. And two, like to be able to defend, oh, be okay defending Weave, who is like you know a, an ultra anti-Semitic troll, you know, like he does not make friends. And he's going to be a very difficult person to defend. <laughs> you know? And I knew that this guy had, you know, he had balls to do that. So I knew he was uh, the real deal. And then, you know, I, I, he's, he's defended quite a few um, notorious hackers before, but I hadn't, I hadn't really heard about it or, or thought about him in a while. And then this came across my radar. And I was like, okay, this is something to pay attention to. This is going to be a big deal because this is actually going to trial. And if this is fought, you know, at trial, a lot can come out of this. Yes, and it's it's so it's fantastic that you mentioned that that sort of background because that for that provides further you know validation like you know he's not necessarily you know like uh, he's in a bad bad situation right now but Roma's not necessarily screwed because Torres had these cases before um, like he's he, uh, he's yeah. he's doing it for decades he's not he's not new at it so um, I guess I guess if you've been doing it for doing this doing it this long then you've you've maybe you're good at it because you have that attitude or maybe you develop it but anyway that's yeah I I I, yeah. I feel very no, I, I, mean, I feel pretty good about it yeah. When you're a defense, I think when you're a defense attorney and you're 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 fighting in federal court constantly, you have to have that attitude, or else you're just going to get walked on. Or, or like what he said, um, you know, a lot of a lot of attorneys will just work with the prosecution to work on a deal, you know, and then just kind of churn their client through the deal factory, right? And they'll yeah. make a killing off of that, you know. But true, if you if you're in it for like the right reasons, you can't do that, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, you fight it. And I think he's a guy that wants to fight. And when you have a client, when he, when he encounters a client who wants to fight, which is like what happened with Weave, I, you know, there was no way Weave was going to take a plea. Um, he was going to fight. Uh, and I think Roman's the same. Like he can't, you know, he can't take the plea because he doesn't have the information to give. And, you know, he wants to fight it. He says, this isn't right. He's, you know, I'm, I think a lot of us, in the, especially early guys in the space, can understand that. You know, you fight. You don't roll over. You do all you can and you fight. Um, so, yeah, when those two forces, types of forces meet, I think it's a good it's a good combo. And I think this is going to be a good case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. So, yeah, we've been going for an hour and 15. And uh, um, yeah, I don't want don't to keep you too much, too much, keep you much longer anyway. But I'll just mention for the for the listeners here, if you want to support Roman's case, uh, toreklin.com. I will pop it up on screen here real quick. And I'll uh, put it in the show notes. But, um, yeah, head on over and, uh, yeah, you know, donate if you can. Um, could happen to anybody. Um, so, yeah, um, certainly. Yeah, I'd certainly appreciate it. Absolutely. And, uh, 
maybe I'll, I'll reach out to Josiah and see if there's any, any Pasnia Bitcoin fund money, uh, Pasnia general fund money to, to send that way. But, um, uh, yeah, thanks SW for, for joining. It was, I was going to have you on to talk about this anyway, and I, I had the, the inclination to invite them on and it worked out. So, um, yeah, I'm glad I did. Yeah, that was, that out. was a great, great coincidence. I was happy to hear that they were going to be on, uh, and always happy, uh, to be, be on here with you, Shane. Hey, cheers, man. Cheers. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll let you go. Um, and, uh, yeah, until next time, uh, until next time, SW, and until next time, uh, TVP listeners and, and viewers, um, you yeah, always remember, Vaughn, is yours for the making, and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers. Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with, with these, you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. You know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point. If you can't communicate without being monitored, it basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. LibertyUnderAttack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom. The intent of the GhostPad is to offer a complete security and privacy hardened computer system that is built from the ground up to be an effective direct action countermeasure for those who want to actively resist the privacy intrusions of the, the entire surveillance state Hydra, both public sector and private sector. A user-friendly computer that the owner maintains exclusive control over every aspect of its operation and has complete control over who accesses what data. A ghost pad is your virtual corner of the room where the cameras, microphones, and other data collection devices have no power. After all, power comes from ownership, which is exclusive control. Unlike practically any other available option, when you buy a ghost pad you are truly its owner. And while the masses beg and bleed to their political corporate masters to loosen their chains, ghost pad owners can use their systems as virtual bolt cutters and cut themselves free. Ghost pads are high-quality business rugged laptops that have had the security compromising system firmware, BIOS firmware, Intel management engine, etc., removed and replaced with more secure, free and open source alternatives. The closed source binary BIOS firmware has been removed from the system board and replaced with free, as in freedom, alternatives as well as the Intel management engine also being neutralized. That combination makes them more secure by design, and preemptively thwarts any attempts by threat actors, both public and private, to gain access by exploiting its vulnerabilities, either by an engineered in and hidden backdoor, or a zero-day exploit in the factory, supplied firmware or the Intel management engine. Perhaps the most important security privacy enhancing feature these systems have, is the neutralizing of the aforementioned Intel management engine, I'm. The IM is a separate computer and a computer that is embedded into all Intel platforms made since 2008. It has its own operating system called Minix. It operates out of band meaning that your primary CPU has no access to monitor what it is doing, and it has direct access to all the hardware that your primary CPU does, making it the ultimate embedded spying device. 
You can't audit what it's doing, it's always on when the computer is plugged in, or has battery power, it has its own network interface with its own MAC address that can bypass any system firewall configuration, it has its own storage you have no access to, it can access your microphone, camera, keyboard, can record keystrokes, and display, can screenshot your encrypted communications, while you are reading and writing them. The IM can only be disabled, by modifying the system's firmware. That can only be accomplished, by using an external programmer to reprogram the chip, that stores the system's firmware. Only select laptop models can be modified. We concentrate on the compatible models with the highest performance available. We offer models that are 2x as powerful as any configuration sold and supported by Lenovo. Transitioning your computing activity to privacy-hardened platforms is a direct action strategy to resist the attempts at total omnipresence by the surveillance state. To put it simply, these systems are some of the few available, that are likely compromised in some way on the firmware level, so they are some of the most secure, and private available for use cases where, the those attributes are the most important. It is also why systems configured this way are considered as ideal to use as a base, to install a security privacy hardened OS, such as Cubes OS, Parrot OS, or other privacy focused Linux distributions, on. To view the full selection of ghost pads, ghost phones, and other privacy tools available via Liberty under attack publications, just visit libertinerattack.com forward slash privacy tools. What are you waiting for? Step up your security culture today. Again, libertinerattack.com forward slash privacy tools. Liberty under attack publications, share your story, find your freedom.